Daily Buckeye Fix. I'm Tom Moore. The Michigan State game is in two days, and the game against Michigan is in nine days. Maybe. Wednesday afternoon, Michigan announced that it was canceling this weekend's game against Maryland due to, COVID, due to a COVID outbreak in its program. They will not be practicing at all until at least next Monday. That Ohio State-Michigan game is now very much in doubt. We'll see if it does get canceled, if the Big Ten is able to schedule another game there. Uh, Wisconsin AD Barry Alvarez floated Wednesday afternoon the idea that yeah, maybe maybe they can find a way around that minimum game requirement for the Big Ten championship game if uh, Ohio State does fall fall short of it. So everything's sort of still a little up in the air, but uh, it'll all it'll all work itself out. Don't you just don't you worry? That's next week's problem. Right now the Buckeyes have uh, have to get ready for Michigan State, and outside of who can and can't play this weekend, one of the biggest questions leading up to this uh, this game this weekend is the OSU pass defense. Uh, Buckeye Scoop's X's and O's guru, Ross Fulton, just took a deep dive in the issues the OSU defense has been having. He joins me to discuss that. Ross, first of all, thank you for giving us an excuse to actually talk a little football instead of testing and contact tracing. <laughs> Happy to do it. As, as much as I enjoy talk, talking, testing and contract tracing. <laughs> well, one thing we should mention right off the top, uh, by some of the advanced metrics like uh, SP+, Plus, the one that Bill Connolly has on ESPN, this defense is actually not all that bad. It, it's not, you know, I think people look at it as it's a total disaster, but some of those advanced metrics that you had in that article suggest like mm, it's, it's really not necessarily quite as bad as people might think. Yeah, that's right. So they're 14th right now, which I, I think ideally you'd like to be in the top 10 in both offense and defense. Um, as an aside, the, the special teams is really, really bad, but, but I didn't talk about that. But as some of that's the small sample size, but you know, 14th is, is manageable, um, with, especially with the fact that the offense is second and is first in a lot of SP Plus's metrics. So you have a really great offense. You have a manageable defense, but the defense could put itself into probably more of like the top 10 range if it just handles the, the glaring issue, which is giving up explosive pass plays. Um, you know, for comparison to, to 2018, which is always like the bad, the bad thing that everyone remembers now, you know, that defense was more like in the 30th range in SP plus by the end of the year. And they had the problem of they gave up lots of explosive plays, but they were both running and passing. This defense is, is pretty good again, the, against the run. So it's really like one specific issue that they need to focus on. Well, with those explosive pass plays being the issue, the next question, of course, is why? Why is that the case? So, you know, obviously part of that is just the talent they'd lost to the NFL and then losing Cam Brown for the season with an Achilles injury obviously didn't help a lot. But given how much the defense is geared towards preventing big plays, like that's the number one thing that they they try to do, it still seems like that shouldn't be happening, you know, as much as it is. Yep, agreed. So, uh, you know, as I discussed in the article, there's basically the defense has like sort of two goals, uh, which is one, stop the run. And so that's why when we talk about they play this 4-3 with a, you know, quote unquote, single high safety, which turns into generally cover three, which means, you know, you have the middle of the field safety playing a deep third and then the two corners playing a deep third. That gives you the rest of the defenders to each take a gap against the run. So they have the run covered across the, the line of scrimmage. And then with the three deep defenders, it's supposed to take away the deep plays. And so the concept being like if a, an opponent can't run the ball and they can't create explosive pass plays, we'll force them to complete a bunch of eight to 10 yard pass plays down the field and see how many times in a row, you know, a college football team can, can accomplish that. The problem is, as you said, is that they're giving up the bust in the back end. And so, uh, you know, <laughs> it's easy to say like, that's just on the Marcus hooker making a bunch of mistakes in terms of continuing to jump crossing routes. And like, you know, I was thinking earlier, like if you replayed the Indiana game, except you had Jordan Fuller back there, then Marcus hooker, like, how, what would the score have been? And, and it may have taken away a few touchdowns from Indiana, but like, you know, you have to work with the players you have, right? And so there are things that they can do to protect themselves uh, in, the, in the secondary, I think, more than they have been. Well, one of the things that you explained was how Ohio State is forced to balance the cover three look you were just talking about with, with some cover one man. Because if you just sit back and cover three, I mean, you, we, we've talked in the past about like, oh, there's man beater plays and zone beater plays. Like, if the other team knows you're going to just sit back in a cover three, like, yep, there is stuff that will work if, if very predictably against a cover three if you're just sitting in that one thing. So you can't be too predictable. But then by being in cover one man, especially with the safety who's not totally up to speed yet, that then opens you up to those big plays. Exactly. So 
you have sort of the two issues, right? And they're having them at both of them, which cover three, there's, you know, it's probably, it's maybe the oldest coverage in football. There's been ways to beat cover three forever. And you see them all the time against Ohio State. You know, the, the easiest one to think of is you have three deep defenders and you just run four receivers vertically. And so you have a four on three down the field. But you also have, you know, like a lot of like three level flood routes to one side. So you get three against two. So there's all kinds of things. And so one issue Ohio State has, again, is they're not staying deep in their cover three and or they have linebackers being too aggressive against the run, I think. And this gets we can talk about this later. I, I see their overrun, overly run focus as a defense. But then, as you said, in cover one, once you get that, now you have you're putting even more on your corners vertically. And again, you would like that deep safety to be able to help. But if you're not getting a lot of help, then that is an inherent tension where, as you said, they do need to play cover one if you're going to sit in a single high safety because the offense can't just know what's coming. And, and that's been a problem at times this year is just knowing what's coming from the defense. But you, again, you, you're then putting some stresses on the defense and, and that causes the need to, to mix and match some more. Well, you mentioned uh, there the you know maybe that they're a little bit overly run focused with with uh, some of the guys in the defense maybe maybe making that like their primary focus and you know you had a list of suggestions of things they could maybe do to solve some of the issues and one of those was to maybe think about focusing on that pass more than they are right now. Yeah, I mean you 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 know you look at the strength of the defense is certainly up front and in the interior. I mean, I would say the front seven, the front six, if you want to focus on. I like to think of this defense as sort of like you have a front six and then the back five. And this gets to the point we, we mentioned a little bit earlier with Ch- trading out Pete Warner and moving him inside and putting Baron Browning at Sam. But so you have essentially, you know, you're, those six defenders, I don't think people have like a lot of concern about them, especially against the run. Um, and then, but you have a lot of issues in the back end. And by playing Br- Browning at Sam instead of where Warner was, to me, that is an effect you, you know, the second safety, you can call it a nickel hybrid position. The, he's that person's out in space. And so last year they had the benefit with Warner of essentially having, even though he's listed as a linebacker, he could effectively function as sort of a nickel hybrid. And Browning has, has played well, but he's just much more of a, like a traditional linebacker. So you've now lost even the flexibility having a, almost a fifth defensive back brings. And so to me, they need to essentially not be so myopically focused on stopping the run and do things like, you know, play more nickel. Like Kerry Combs was sort of defensive after the Indiana game. It's like, well, we use nickel on third down. It's like, well, there's, there's not a rule against using it on first or second down, particularly when the opponent has negative yards rushing and you're up by three touchdowns. And, and you could see that difference in the last two drives of that game where they played nickel every play. And so, you know, you had Josh Proctor on, Davis, David Ellis, Indiana's running back out of the backfield instead of Baron Brownie. You know, I mean, that those kind of things can make a difference. And also, I think, you know, then there's like more subtle things where they can not have their linebackers quite so keyed. You know, I put out in the article, like Penn State hurt them in the second half by against cover three, like hitting a lot of RPOs, uh, run pass options behind the linebackers coming to play the run. Like, you know, it's like, you can tell your linebackers, like, let's be a little bit more conservative. Let's sit for a second and watch the play. Again, particularly, like, take the game situation into account. We're up several scores. Um, and, you know, and then I think they need just to, to make some more pass-first coverages. So, like, cover three and cover one, there, there, there's nothing wrong with them playing that, and I think they should continue to. That's the defense. But, like, you know, mix in some cover two occasionally just to give the offense a different look. You're, again, protecting your safeties by having two of them back there. Well, and – you know, this this weekend is one of the most intriguing Ohio State games I can remember in 20 years, just because we don't know who's going to be out there this weekend. We don't know <laughs> who's going to be playing, who's not going to be playing. You know, is there going to be some position where they're missing three guys? Is there going to be some position, you know, or, or is everyone going to be out there on one side of the ball and they're missing a whole bunch of guys on the other side of the ball? I mean, it, it, it's uh, from some of the uh, some of the interviews we've done. Uh, I think it was Dr. Borchers on Saturday said there was not, you know, it wasn't like really concentrated. So it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't sound like like one particular unit has been completely decimated. So it's kind of going to be people from all over the place. So, you know, with all that, with all those caveats thrown out there, you know, if they are missing a guy or two from the defensive backfield, how would you adjust to that this weekend to, to still, you know, ideally 
be able to, you know, at least limit the big plays and, and uh, you know, if you don't have the guys back there that you normally would. Yeah, I, I think that puts even more uh, emphasis on, on some of the suggestions I just made for playing the pass. Like, I think you have to be conservative and force Michigan State to move the football down the field. I mean, Michigan State has been pretty, not particularly good on offense this year, but the one thing they have had some success in a few games is is hitting some downfield throws. And so, again, I mean, if I'm Ohio State, I just want to sit back and soft coverages like, and, and force them to prove that they can move the football down the field. And, like, you know, I know that can sometimes be frustrating to watch as a fan if, if teams are gaining, like, little chunks of yards on underneath hitches or, you know, four yards or run. But, you know, I just don't think Michigan State can sustain that. So, again, I think it's, you know, incumbent upon the coaches to mix zone coverages, you know, make sure that they stay over the top of routes. And, again, like, count on your, your defensive front to essentially be able to control the run and, and, and have your back six or back five play more pass focus first. Yeah, and uh, Rocky Lombardi, their quarterback this, uh, this year, averaging 54% completions. Uh, per game. He was uh, against Northwestern 11 for 27 for 167 yards, two touchdowns and a pick against Indiana, three of seven for 21 yards <laughs> against uh, Iowa, yeah. 17 of 37 it, for, you know, 45% completions. He he completed 72% of his passes against Rutgers. And then it's been 53%, 45%, 42%, 40% uh, the rest of the way. So, I mean, yeah. against a quarterback like that, that sounds like you know, if they do limit the big plays, this could be a little bit of a kind of a get well game for the Ohio State defense. Yeah, it should be. And I, I mean, you hope, I mean, I was gonna say Michael Penix only threw for what, 51%. But when you're 50, <laughs> you know, when you hit four or five that are 70 yards each, it sort of uh, evens out. And so again, I think that, and that's the thing that I think is a little bit frustrating about this defense is like, they'll play very well for long stretches. And then it's kind of these same issues of getting stale, making mistakes and certain things that kind of like, then they seem to sort of snowball. And so I just think that they sort of have to, you know, even especially if like guys are out, is just sort of get back to basics, but, you know, keep things mixed up in those basic looks. I know that sounds a little strange, but, you know, base coverages, but rotate through them and, you know, try to keep as again, everything in front of you and sort of, you know, try to string together a whole game. <laughs> well, uh, this has been quite a week already at BuckeyeScoop.com. We have had just a ton of insider reports from uh, Nevada Buck. <laughs> we were talking before the show that this is this has been a week when it's really hard to focus because it's just there's constantly something going on and new questions getting raised. They're like, oh, man, I don't know the answer to that. We hurry off to the insiders board and see who on staff knows the answer to these questions. And this is this is one of the most like for for a game against a team that has not had a particularly good season. This is one of the most intriguing Ohio State games I can remember. So this would uh, this would actually be a great week to be a member of BuckeyeScoop.com. In fact, and uh, we've had a ton of uh, insider practice reports. We are not talking to anyone on the record for Ohio State all week. No player interviews, no coach interviews, no nothing. So if uh, if you want to know what's going on inside Ohio State football this week, the only way you can do it is uh, the insider access you can get at BuckeyeScoop.com. And uh, you can become a member today. Give it a uh, sign up for a month. And your first month, if you start today, will include this week, the Michigan State game, the Michigan game, if there is a Michigan game, the Big Ten championship game, college football playoff selection show, big uh, college football playoff semifinals. That's, that's all in your first month. So this would be a fantastic time to become a member of BuckeyeScoop.com. Just go to the site, sign up right there. Also, hey, I've suggested this before. Might not be a bad Christmas present. If, you, if, you're, uh, if you're thinking, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I want this year. Get a, get a uh, yearly membership to BuckeyeScoop.com. And uh, then you're the, uh, the gift that keeps giving all year round. As we've said, it is the Jelly of the Month Club of Ohio State football. So that, uh, that will do it for today. Thank you guys for joining us. We will be back tomorrow morning with... Uh, I mean, Lord only knows what Lord, what will happen in the next 24 hours. What will we be talking about tomorrow? Normally, normally I have these shows planned out this this week. It's just like, uh, yeah, we'll we'll see. But we will whatever we're talking about. We will be back tomorrow. Ross, thank you for joining us. Thank you guys for listening. Have a great day. We will talk to you tomorrow.